Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 29 Out prospecting A silver mine at last Making a fortune with sledge and drill A hard road to travel We own in claims A rocky country True knowledge of the nature of silver mining came fast enough. We went out prospecting with Mr. Ballou. We climbed the mountain sides and clambered among sagebrush, rocks, and snow till we were ready to drop with exhaustion. We found no silver, nor yet any gold. Day after day we did this. Now and then we came upon holes burrowed a few feet into the declivities and apparently abandoned abandoned, and now and then we found one or two listless men still burrowing, but there was no appearance of silver. These holes were the beginnings of tunnels, and the purpose was to dry them hundreds of feet into the mountain, and some day tap the hidden ledge where the silver was. Some day. It seemed far enough away, and very hopeless and dreary. Day after day we toiled and climbed and searched, and we young, younger partners grew sicker and still sicker of the promiseless toil. At last we halted under a beetling rampart of rock which projected from the earth high upon the mountain. Mr. Ballou broke off some fragments with a hammer and, and examined them long and attentively with a small eyeglass, threw them away and broke off more. He said this rock was quartz, and the quartz was a sort of rock that contained silver. Contained it. I had thought that at least it would be caked on the outside of it like a veneering. He still broke off pieces and critically examined them, now and then wetting the piece with his tongue and applying the glass. At last he exclaimed, We've got it! We were full of anxiety in a moment. The rock was clean and white where it was broken, and across it ran a ragged thread of blue. He said that that little thread had silver in it, mixed with base metals such as lead and, and antimony and other rubbish, and that there was a speck of, or two of gold visible. After a great deal of effort, we managed to discern some little fine yellow specks, and judged that a couple of tons of them massed together might make a gold dollar, possibly. We were not jubilant, but Mr. Ballou said there were worse ledges in the world than that. He saved what he called the richest piece of the rock in order to determine its value by the process called the fire assay. Then we named the mine Monarch of the Mountains. Modesty of nomenclature is not a prominent feature in the mines. And Mr. Ballou wrote out and stuck up the following notice, preserving a copy to be entered upon the books in the mining recorder's office in the town. Notice, we the undersigned claim three claims of 300 feet each and one for discovery on this silver bearing quartz lead or load extending north and south from this notice with all its dips, spurs, and angles, variations, and sinew sites, and sinuosities together with 50 feet of ground on either side for working the same. We put our names to it and tried to feel that our fortunes were made, but when we talked the matter all over with Mr. Ballou, we felt depressed and dubious. He said that this surface course was not all there was of our mine, but that the wall or ledge of rock called the Monarch of the Mountains extended down hundreds and hundreds of feet into the earth. He illustrated by saying it was like a curbstone, and maintain a nearly uniform thickness, say 20 feet, away down into the bowls of the earth, and was perfectly distinct from the cat casing rock on each side of it, and that it kept to itself and maintained its distinctive character always, no matter how deep it extended into the earth or how far it stretched itself through and across the hills and valleys. He said it might be a mile deep and ten miles long, for all we knew and that wherever we bored into it, above ground or below, we would find gold and silver in it, but no gold or silver in the meaner rock that was cased between. And he said that down in the great depths of the ledge, 
was its richness, and the deeper it went, the richer it grew. Therefore, instead of working here on the surface, we must either bore down into the rock with a shaft till we came to, to where it was rich, say a hundred feet or so, or else we must go down into the valley and bore a long tunnel into the mountainside and tap the ledge far under the earth. To do either was plainly the labor of months, for we could blast and bore only a few feet a day, some five or six. But this was not all. He said that after we got the ore out, it must be hauled in wagons to a distant silver mill, ground up in the silver extracted by a tedious and costly process. Our fortune seemed a century away. But we went to work. We decided to sink a shaft. So for a week we climbed the mountain, laden with picks, drills, gads, crowbars, shovels, cans of blasting powder, and coils of fuse, and strove with might and main. At first the rock was broken and loose, and we dug it up with picks and threw it out with shovels, and the hole progressed very well. But the rock became more compact presently, and gads and crowbars came into play but shortly nothing could make an impression but blasting powder. That was the weariest work. One of us held the iron drill in its place, and another would strike with an eight-pound sledge. It was like driving nails on a large scale. In the course of an hour or two, the drill would reach a depth of two or three feet, making the hole a couple of inches in diameter. We would put in a charge of powder, insert half a yard of fuse, pour in sand and gravel, and ram it down then light the fuse and run. When the explosion came and the rocks and smoke shot into the air, we would go back and find about a bushel of that hard, rebellious quartz jolted out. Nothing more. One week of this satisfied me. I resigned. Claggett and Oliphant followed. Our shaft was only 12 feet deep. We decided that a tunnel was the thing we wanted. So we went down the mountainside and worked a week, at the end of which time we had blasted a tunnel about deep enough to hide a hogshead in, and judged that about 900 feet more of it would reach the ledge. I resigned again, and the other boys only held out one day longer. We decided that a tunnel was not what we wanted. We wanted a ledge that was already developed. There were none in the camp. We dropped the monarch for the time being. Meantime, the camp was filling up with people, and there was a constantly growing excitement about our Humboldt mines. We fell victims to the epidemic and strained every nerve to acquire more feet. We prospected and took up new claims, put notices on them, and gave them grandiloquent names. We traded some of our feet for feet in other people's claims. In a little while, we owned largely in the Gray Eagle, the Columbiana, the Branch Mint, the, the Maria Jane, the Universe, the Root Hog or Die, the Samson and Delilah, the Treasure Trove, the Golconda, the Sultana, the Boomerang, the Great Republic, the Grand Mogul, and 50 other mines that had never been molested by a shovel or scratched with a pick. We had not less than 30,000 feet apiece in the richest mines on earth as the frenzied cant phrased it, and were in debt to the butcher. We were stark mad with excitement, drunk with happiness, smothered under mountains of prospective wealth, arrogantly compassionate toward the plodding millions who knew not our marvelous canyon. But our credit was not good at the grocer's. It was the strangest phase of life one can imagine. It was a beggar's revel. There was nothing doing in the district, no mining, no milling, no productive effort, no income, not enough money in the entire camp to buy a corner lot in an eastern village, hardly, and yet a stranger would have supposed he was walking among bloated millionaires. Prospecting parties swarmed out of town with the first flush of dawn, and swarmed in again at nightfall, laden with spoil, rocks, nothing but rocks. Every man's pockets were full of them. The floor of his cabin was littered with them. They were disposed in labeled rows on his shelves. Chapter 30 Disinterested Friends How Feet Were Sold We Quit Tunneling 
a trip to Esmeralda, my companions, an Indian prophecy, a flood, our quarters during it. I met men at every turn who owned from 1,000 to 30,000 feet in undeveloped silver mines, every single foot of which they believed would shortly be worth from 50 to 1,000 dollars, and as often as any other way they were men who had not 25 dollars in the world. Every man you met had his new mine to boast of, and his specimens ready, and if the opportunity offered he would infallibly back you into a corner and offer as a favor to you, not to him, to part with just a few feet in the Golden Age or the Sarah Jane or some other unknown stack of croppings for money enough to get a square meal with, as the phrase went. And you were never to reveal that he had made you the offer at such a ruinous price for it was only out of friendship for you that he was willing to make the sacrifice. Then he would fish a piece of rock out of his pocket, and after looking mysteriously around, as if he feared he might be waylaid and robbed if caught with such wealth in his possession, he would dab the rock against his tongue, clap an eyeglass to it, and exclaim, Look at that, right there in that red dirt. See it? See the specks of gold and the streak of silver. That's from the Uncle Abe. There's a hundred thousand tons like that in sight. Right in sight, mind you. And when we get down on it and the ledge comes in solid, it will be the richest thing in the world. Look at the assay. I don't want you to believe me. Look at the assay. Then he would get out a greasy sheet of paper, which showed that the portion of rock assayed had given evidence of containing silver and gold in the proportion of so many hundreds of thousands of dollars to the ton. I little knew then that the custom was to hunt out the richest piece of rock and get it assayed. Very often that piece, the size of a filbert, was the only fragment in a ton that had a particle of metal in it. And yet the assay made it pretend to represent the average value of the ton of rubbish it came from. Of such a system of assaying as that, the Humboldt world had gone crazy. On the authority of such assays, its newspaper correspondents were frothing about rock worth four and seven thousand dollars a ton. And does the reader remember a few pages back the calculations of a quoted correspondent, whereby the ore is to be mined and shipped all the way to England? the metals extracted and the gold and silver contents received back by the miners as clear profit, the copper antimony and other things in the ore being sufficient to pay all the expenses incurred. Everybody's head was full of such calculations as those, such raving insanity rather. Few people took work into their calculations, or outlay of money either, except the work and expenditures of other people. We never touched our tunnel or our shaft again. Why? Because we judged that we had learned the real secret of success in silver mining, which was not to mine the silver ourselves by the sweat of our brows and the labor of our hands, 